Thank you. Thanks for uh, for having me. Thanks to the organizers for this being great, for organizing, putting together such a great event, for having me and being accommodating in various ways. Um, so that's me. Um, uh, <laughs> yay, imposter syndrome. Uh, I, I joined security quite late. I was. I was doing a, a career in. Um, I was going for a career in mathematics. Uh, I was originally going for a career in, in mathematics. I was a mathematician, and I was dreaming to become, you know, to spend the rest of my life doing math. Now, life doesn't always go the way you want it, and um, for by always by accident, I ended up in in, in security, uh, which I haven't regretted a single day since. Uh, but at the same time. When I discovered that these objects, these elliptic curves that I used to use in, um, that I used to study in, in, in uh, as a mathematician, are um, uh, do play a, a big role in, um, in 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 security in elliptic curve cryptography. Uh, it was very exciting. So uh, I don't do this in my day job, but I do uh, study. Uh, I, I do like talking about elliptic curve cryptography and. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I hope you'll enjoy it. And I, sh I should actually add two more disclaimers. The first disclaimer is that I, something went wrong with the slides I realized. So they're, they're supposed to appear in, in steps, uh, and they now appear, the, the final version, every time. Um, I, I hope that's OK. And the, the, and the second somewhat related uh, disclaimer that I need to add is that I'm feeling not particularly great this morning, and uh, that affects my brain in all sorts of ways. I, I'll try and be as coherent as possible, but apologize in advance when I'm not. Uh, so three other disclaimers that, that I had, uh, had had put on the slides. The first is that I am not a cryptographer, and I shouldn't pretend to be one. I mean, I've, I've studied elliptic curves well enough that I could implement the algorithms, but I would make mistakes. I would make catastrophic mistakes, um, and I'm definitely not qualified to study other people's algorithms. Um, and, and the second uh, disclaimer is that if you want to be someone who studies elliptic curve cryptography, you really have to study the math. You really have to spend probably years studying the algebra, the geometry, the cryptography. And that's not something that I can do in, in 45 minutes. So I, I will really hope that after this talk you have some high level idea of what's going on in elliptic curve cryptography, which you may come across in, in various ways in your, in your day job or in your free time. Um, but I, I don't want to pretend that this is actually something that you can use in, in, in practice straight away. And, and finally, my goal is really to uh, explain things, to, to help you understand very broadly what's going on. And I find that more important than to be correct, than to include all edge cases. So there are various places where I just skip a corner and, and sometimes saying a few things that are technically wrong. And if, if, if some of you have studied elliptic curve cryptography, uh, you probably know this, and I apologize. I don't think they're wrong in, in a crucial way, but yeah, technically, not everything is correct. Um, so this is what an elliptic curve looks like. This is every introduction to elliptic curve starts with this formula, y squared equals x cubed plus a times x plus b, and, and the prime number p. And that's always the prime number p, because this is cryptography, and that's always prime numbers. That's true. I also find this particularly unhelpful. It, it, this doesn't give you any insight. The only thing, the only part of this that I think is, is worth understanding is that there's a choice to be made. In fact, there are three choices to be made. Different A, different B, and different P give different elliptic curves. And some curves are far more suitable for elliptic curve cryptography than others. So every elliptic curve algorithm always starts by choose a curve E. OK. This, I think, is helpful. This is a picture of an elliptic curve. Now, you've probably seen this. This is, if you have ever read anything about elliptic curve, they include a picture like this. Sometimes they include a different picture, which has two parts. Like there's kind of a circle-like thing on the left, and, and just a simple curve um, to the right. There's no difference between one and two curves, not in a way that is relevant here. I find this less confusing, but if, if, you, if you read an article that, that uses the other picture, that's, that's just as fine. There's nothing wrong there. Now, on this curve are points, a, a great many points in general, though a finite number of points, and we'll use that later on. And 
the fact that there are a finite number of points is because it's prime number p. Uh, everything is over mod p, and that make uh, that makes computers able to deal with this because computers can only deal with, with finite um, sets. So here's an important construction. We take two points on the elliptic curve, call them P and Q, and we take the line through P and Q. And as it turns out, this line has a unique third crossing point. That's that's a property of elliptic curves. Uh, that's generally true, and that's very helpful, and that's because of the X cubed in the formula. Anyway, th there is always some such a third point. That's what re relevant. Now, from this point, we can take the vertical line through this point. Uh, alternatively, we can take the mirror image in the horizontal axis, which I've drawn there. And this gives another point. And this point I call P plus Q. I cannot stress enough that this is not supposed to make sense. I, I haven't, I haven't, I'm not explaining how you add P and Q. I'm just saying, here's a construction, taking a point P and a point Q, and this construction gives a point, a third point that, that I call it, that we call P plus Q. And that's it. And that's a related construction. And that starts with a single point, P. And I'm trying to add P to itself. Now, you can't really take the line through P and P, because there are many of them. But it turns out you can take the unique line through P that is tangent to the curve, that touches the curve. And this line, again, has uh, another unique second point of crossing, and we can take the, again, the vertical line through it, or the mirror image, and find another crossing point, and this I call P plus P. And actually, I call it two times P. Again, not supposed to make sense, I'm just defining something. And we can combine these things, so I can uh, add P and two times P. So again, take the line, take the mirror image, we got two times P plus P which I call three times P, as you probably would have guessed. And you can go on like this. You can get four times P and five times P and etc. And computers can, can calculate these things. And you'll notice that going from P, two times P, three times P goes all over the place of the elliptic curve. There's no structure. This all over the placeness, word I just made up, that's crucial to elliptic curve cryptography, as we'll see in a second. Oh, um, yeah. okay. Everything works like you'd expect. So uh, it's not supposed to make sense, this, this addition, but it turns out, okay, uh, it's not completely stupid either because this works like normal addition in many ways. So P plus Q, Q is equals Q plus P. That's something that you can see if you think back to the construction. Uh, less obvious, but something that you can figure out yourself at home if you feel like it, is that if you add two points and then add a third point, it doesn't matter in which order you do it. So you can add P plus Q and then add R, or you can add Q plus R and then add P the same. And the same with integer multiplication. So you take a point P, you multiply it with M, and then with N, um, and you get N. Uh, but you can also multiply N and M first, and then multiply it with P, etc. All the rules that you expect work. And the points on the elliptic curve call what mathematicians, uh, or form what mathematicians call an abelian group. Uh, yeah, okay, there are a few places where my slides will be a bit funny because of the PDF issues, and, and it's my mistake, so I apologize for that. Uh, you're supposed to st do not look beyond the first line. Um, you just pretend that's only the first line, and uh, just pretend that the first line says, the goal is given a point P, calculate n times P for some n, and I use n as 100 as an example. And that takes 99 steps, don't cheat. It takes 99 steps, trust me. I mean, Two times p, three times p, four times p, it's five times p, etc. Ninety-nine steps to get a hundred times p. Actually, no. As you can see, computers can do it faster by combine, cleverly combining doubling and adding points. So, from p you go to two times p, this is doubling. You add p, it's uh, three times p, and you double again and again and again. You get twenty-four times p, and then you get twenty-five times p by adding p and then doubling twice. You get a hundred times p. So that's eight steps to go from P to 100 times P. You can probably do it a little bit faster even. Um, but that's, that's the, the kind of order of things. W which means that if you do this, say, six times in a row, you go from P to a trillion times P in 48 steps. So the kind of numbers you see in elliptic curve cryptography, they're usually of the form a trillion times a trillion. That, or not of the form, but of the, of, of the order of magnitude. 
um, which would take about 100 steps. So a computer can do that in, in a fraction of a second. Um, that's cool. Now, the opposite is not true. So if I give someone, if I give a computer a point n times p, and n times p is a point on the curve, so I'm not saying here's n and here's p, I'm saying here's a point, say q, and q is n times p, and here's p, find n. And a computer can't do much else than just trying two times p, three times p, four times p, five times p, etc. No, nothing significantly faster it can do, which means that if my numbers are a trillion times a trillion big, then the computer needs to do so many steps. And even for very fast computers, at some point it's going to take it millions of years. So this is called the discrete logarithm problem of elliptic curves. And that's the core of all cryptography. Uh, sorry, of all elliptic curve cryptography. Um, so probably the most important implementation or at least the mo most well-known implementation of elliptic curves is the elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman um, key agreement protocol. Um, so this is cryptography, so we always have Alice and Bob, and Alice and Bob want to agree on a secret key over a public channel. And so, so Alice and Bob, may, you know, you can think of it as Alice and Bob being here in this room and they don't trust anyone else, but they want to find some kind of encryption key that they can use then another algorithm to uh, encrypt some, some messages. Um, and I put agree in inverted commas because they don't agree, they actually construct the curve as we'll see, uh, the, 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 the key as we'll see. So each has, um, each has kind of half of the key and, and together they make the full key. So um, we assume that Alice and Bob already know, have somehow established that they're talking to each other. There's no man in the middle, there's no Eve in the middle or, or Mallory who, who's pretending to Alice to be Bob and to Bob to be Alice. Uh, we assume they've already done that, and that's, that's crucial. Uh, but there are ways to do that with certificates, uh, for example. And it's, it's helpful to think in practice that Alice is a web browser and um, Bob is a web server. So first, Alice and Bob agree on a elliptic curve E and a point P on the curve. Um, they do this publicly. Um, they usually refer to some kind of standard where P and P are defined. Now, Alice chooses a large random number A, a trillion times a trillion, that sort of numbers. So keep that secret. Bob also chooses a large random number, lowercase b. Also keep that secret. Alice calculates A times P and sends this point to Bob. So Alice says, hey, Bob, here's a point A times P. And remember, anyone can see this. Anyone knows P. Anyone can see A times P. But thanks to the discrete logarithm problem, no one can actually find A. Likewise, Bob calculates B times P and sends this point B times P to Alice. And um, Alice then calculates, so Alice takes this B times P that Bob sent her, keeps, uses her own secret number A and calculates A times B times P. And Bob calculates B times A times P because Bob uh, knows B, that's a secret number, and Alice has sent them A times P. And as we've seen before, the order doesn't, doesn't matter um, because that's how integer multiplication works. So this is the same point. So this point, somehow converted to a number, is, can be used as a secret key. This is used widely. This is how elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman works. Uh, so here's a summary, because I'll refer to it a few times, so it's good to have a very general picture. Publicly known are a curve E and a point P on this curve. Again, referring to some standard. Alice uses random number A, Bob random number B. Alice sends A times B to Bob. Bob sends B times P to Alice. And the shared secret, shared secret key is A times B times P, or B times A times P, which is the same. Sometimes you see not ECDH, but ECDHE, which is the ephemeral version of elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, um, which means that Alice and Bob choose different A and B for each connection. So. Every, uh, Alice and Bob can choose a, a fixed random number that they keep it to themselves, um, but they can also choose a different A and B in each connection. If they do that, um, that means they can't use A and B for authentication, because it, uh, I'll show you later the signature algorithm where you can use your, your private key. They can't use it this way. The advantage of this is forward secrecy. Forward secrecy means that 
um, uh, forward secrecy is, be is best understood to, uh, when something is not forward secret. So if Bob used the same B all the time for Alice, but for everyone else, Bob is a web server, so many connections, and someone knocks on Bob's door, uses a wrench, said, give me your number B, someone who has that number B can then decrypt any conversation they have seen in the past, because uh, assuming they've recorded the eight, eight times B, uh, that Alice sent them, because they can multiply it with B that they now know, and they can find the, the key, and they can decrypt everything else, which is not what you want. So this is why, despite the disadvantage, this is why elliptic diffie uh is usually used in its ephemeral form. So let's see something in practice. You're not supposed to be able to read this, so don't worry. Uh, you just Many of you will recognize this. Hey, that's Wireshark. Uh, yeah, so this is actually a Wireshark session of a HTTPS connection between my laptop, that's this one here, and some random web server at nsec.io, which, as it should, uses HTTPS. So my laptop says, okay, we're gonna talk HTTPS, so let's agree on a cyber suite. And a cyber suite includes a number of algorithms, because in TLS, there are actually a number of algorithms used for different things, but one of them is the key exchange algorithm. And um, my, my laptop, my uh, uh, Firefox, um, suggested 11 cybers, the first eight of which, so the first uh, eight most preferable ones, uh, all in use elliptic curve Diffie Hellman uh, and its ephemeral version. Okay, so server responds and says, uh, okay, that's, um, let's, uh, let's use uh, this one, TLS uh, with elliptic curve Diffie Hellman ephemeral with RSA AS256 with the color quantum mode and SHA384 for hashing, whatever that means. We care about elliptic curve Diffie Hellman. Now, um, the, the client, my laptop, then uh, uh, sent a certificate to or checks a certificate to authenticate. Uh, that's not relevant here. Um, this is again the server. The server says, "Okay, let's use a named curve. Let's use a curve that's referred to in a standard, which I've implemented, and let's use the name curve um, NIST curve uh, P256. That's a, w a widely used curve." that we'll actually see later. And my public key, which is my point, the, the B times P, has length 65, 65 bytes. Uh, it talks about trillions, um, uh, trillion times trillion, and it's probably more than that. Uh, and it looks like in, in hacks, 04, 96, et cetera. And uh, my browser then chooses to send uh, A times P, and uh, from now on they can together, each of them can calculate the same encryption key, and I can't see what happens in my wire succession, wi wire succession, because I haven't hacked my browser. So yeah, from then on, everything is invisible. So this is how elliptic curve diffie Hellman is, is widely used in practice. Um, okay. Encrypting or, or key exchange is one prop important property. Another important property of elliptic curve, uh, sorry, another important use case of elliptic curve cryptography is digital signatures. Um, and you've all seen digital signatures, uh, and, and it, it shows, um, basically there are two ways different signatures are used. One, to authenticate an important piece of document, like, okay, I've seen this document, I, I uh, add my signature so that I've seen it, I agree with it. But also, and for example in um, an HTTPS, just to prove who you are. Like, okay, here's a random, some random data, I signed it with my key to show that it can only be me, not someone else. So I signed it with my, my private key. You can check that it corresponds to my public key. I need a few definitions to explain this. So the first one is, a, is that um, I mentioned that on a curve, uh, a curve has a finite number of points, which means in practice, if I start with P, and go two times P, and three times P, and four times P, uh, just in theory, in theoretically, you know, at some point, I need to get back to P. And the order is the number of points you've met this way. So n times P is the last new point, and then n plus one times P is P again. So the order is the smallest n, but n plus one times P is P. It's, it's the number of points in the loop. And that's actually easy to calculate, because, because mathematics, basically. Uh, you don't have to worry about really trying all the, all the numbers. There are very easy ways, various easy ways to do this. Um, secondly, for the number k, and k is just, just a number, it's not elliptic curve. Uh, I mean, I write k inverse to be the inverse of k mod n. 
uh, and it's this order number. If you don't, if you're not familiar with these things, that's fine. Don't worry about it. But it, it works like like you you expect one one divided by k to work. The definition is that k times k inverse equals one mod n. So k times k inverse minus one is a uh, is a multiple of n. Anyway, don't don't worry too much about it. It just works like an inverse. And finally, uh, there are a number of cases here and later on where we need to turn p, the point, the point p into a number. Uh, and the point p can be represented by a computer, and a computer can turn this into a number in, in a number of ways, different ways in different cases. But um, that's one of these details that I skip over. But I, when I write p between vertical bars, between pipes, I think some might call them, uh, that's just p seen as, as an actual number, a number that you can add up, multiply in, in the same way that you've known since primary school. Okay, so Alice has some data, and, and data is always assumed to be a large number, m. And if data is larger, is, is an even larger number, then we hash it first. Uh, that's not very relevant here, but that always happens in signature algorithms. We assume there is a large number, m, m Alice wants to sign. So she wants to show, okay, I had at some point this number, m, which is public, but I also had my private key, which only I know, and anyone can check my public key and then confirm that I have signed it and no one else did. Okay. Uh, again, given our elliptic curve E and a point P of order N on, on that curve, and Alice has a private key A and a public key A times P. A times P is public, P is known, but you can't calculate A because it's a strict logarithm problem. So the algorithm goes as follows. Alice uses a random number K between one and N. Uh, that's not particularly relevant, but a, a random large number. Alice then calculates um, k times the point p and sees it as a number. And she calls it r. Okay. She can do that easily. p is public. Uh, she, k is a random number. Uh, r doesn't give away anything about k. It just is, is a number. It, it, it's k times p is a point and turn it to a number. Then she can calculate m, which is the message, plus r times a. a is a secret number divided by k or, or times k inverse, and she calls that s. And I should make it clear, you know, she uses her a here, but the way it's used, the fact that k is unknown, means that someone who, who doesn't know k um, can't in any way, can't find any information about a. Signature is then r, comma, so the, the pair of numbers. What I always find counterintuitive, and I guess many find counterintuitive, that there isn't a unique signature. A different random number leads to a different, uh, a different signature, a different pair of numbers, different r comma s, and they're all fine. Um, it matters that the, the, what matters is that there are out of the gazillion times gazillion possible signatures, there are only a trillion times a trillion possible right ones, which means that there's a probability of exactly zero that you ever that the random combination is, is the right one. So, but there are multiple signatures, and number k needs to be chosen randomly. Someone else, some Bob, tries to f get this uh, this number, um, gets this this pair, can actually very easily confirm that this is uh, uh, this is a valid signature signed by Alice, uh, based on the public key uh, a times p and and these two numbers and and the information about the curve that's public. Uh, I haven't written down how that works because it requires a few extra things out of the curves that are probably more confusing, uh, but you can look it up. It's on, it's on Wikipedia, for example. Okay, so what if k isn't chosen randomly? What if, if Alice just misread the, sta uh, the, the standard and thought, okay, you know, I've got a nice random number k. I'll use it all the time. I mean, it saves me CPU power. I mean, maybe Alice is, Alice is Sony or something. You know, I think, hey, I can save CPU power. I'll, I'll, I'll explain why Sony is relevant here in a sec. Um, so we got two signatures, two pairs of R and S, which generated with the same K. And actually, if, if you look back, how R is generated, R only depends on K and, and the point P, which is the same. Which means that if K is the same, then R is the same in two signatures. So only S is different. So there's an S and an S prime, because I use different messages. So okay, yeah. L assigns two messages, M and M prime. This, this little accent is called the prime in, in, in mass. Uh, and she signs them uh, with the same, using the same random number. Um, you can easily see, and that's it's really primary school math. Uh, if you 
and combine these two things, then uh, m minus m prime, which are public, you know, messages are public, uh, divided by s minus s prime, which again, there are signatures that are seen, that actually gives the number k, this reused number. And if you know k, then from the definition of, of s, you can, uh, you can easily uh, solve a. Uh, so if Alice only uses the same random number twice, you don't have to know which it is, but you can calculate the random number, you can calculate their private key, and everything else is disastrous from there. And this was used uh, in, in this way, incorrectly, by Sony and its PlayStation. I think people, in 2013 it was, people were able to um, upload arbitrary code or something, which was normally is a signature check. Uh, and yeah, okay, if you know the, the private key, you can, you can just sign it yourself. Uh, there's a slightly more subtle variant of this, which is if, if k is different but not completely random, and actually in that case, it takes a bit of time, but if k's are related, then you can still solve a, uh, a Bitcoin wallet has, uh, has made a mistake at some point. I think every crypto mistake ever has been made in Bitcoin wallets, and probably the ones that we knew, didn't know about. Uh, let's see how we're doing for time. Okay. Um, okay. I've mentioned random numbers a few times. Um, random numbers are very important in cryptography. Elliptic curve cryptography is no exception. So, um, computers, unfortunately, are not very good at randomness. That, that's kind of a feature of computers. They, they are predictable. I know it doesn't always feel like it when this morning I was doing something with my slides. But in general, computers are predictable. They're very bad at random things. So, they don't have enough randomness. They have some randomness. Sometimes there's a random number generator device, like some using um, radioactive something, or uh, you, can, you can measure how long it takes to st store certain data on a hard drive and then take the least significant numbers behind the decimal dot, and that also gives you some random numbers. But it's usually, you don't have enough crew through randomness. So what the computer does is it uses a, a pseudo-random number generator, and that's which generate numbers that are random for all practical purposes, but are generated by an algorithm with a true random input, a true random seed. It works kind of like, like this in the picture. So you, you get true randomness, you, you input it in your algorithm, you get an internal state that, that's kept secret, and then based on that you output some random data. Internal state fed back into the algorithm, and you get more data. I, I always imagine it's something like a machine that, that churns out random numbers while you, while you turn some, some handle. Okay, one, one way to look at the discrete logarithm problem, and I'm, I'm gonna show you a random number generator that uses elliptic curve cryptography, is that it looks that taking n, and then taking n times p uh, looks like a random operation. Uh, n times p, uh, taking the number. Because it doesn't give any in away any information about n, so if you just see n times p, that looks completely random. It's completely mangled up, this, this number. You, you don't get any information about n. So this is, we can use this. So this is a very simple way. Uh, and, and ignore the red bit for a bit. Uh, so, uh, okay, there's a random seed, you call it n0, multiplied with, with a fixed point p, p is, is given uh, on a curve, and take the number, the, the vertical bar, the corresponding number, called n1, that my output, so the green one is the internal state, and the blue one is the output, and, and get n2, uh, etc. You, you can do it, it is easy, it can be done fast, um, you can't, predict what's going out. Well, unless you somehow see one of the outputs. Say, say you somehow see n1. And that's not, that, that's, that's not a bug. It's a feature in random number generators that sometimes the output is public. There are lots of ways in which random numbers are, 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 are published in a, in, in as part of an algorithm. Like there's an algorithm that needs the server to send some random data. So we can assume that uh, at some point someone has access to n1. That, that's a feature. But well, if they do that, then they can kind of calculate n, n2 by using the, the red thing, which is exactly the same as the arrow up there. I mean, the, 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 the vertical arrows, they don't do anything. You just take the same number. So if you know the one output, n1, then, um, then you know the whole internal state. And you can pr predict all random numbers. So this doesn't work. Thankfully, um, we can vary a bit. Because the problem here is, is that these vertical lines, they're, they're actually they're equal signs. You know, so you can go back just as easily. But what if we use a second random number, sorry, a second point on the curve, Q, and um, 
we multiply so we, we multiply n1 so we multiply this point q by by n1 first then we get r1 this is an actual algorithm so it, it generates 32 bytes numbers it actually throws away two bytes the rest is, is the output so this way you can't go back so if you see r1 if you see the 30 bytes of r1 uh, you may be able to calculate the full output but you can't go back because that's the discrete logarithm problem so Okay, you're stuck. Seeing one output, which is a feature, doesn't give you any information about the elliptic, uh, about the random number generator, about its internal state. So that's that's a good random number generator. Yeah. Okay. Here, I just you, I'm going to explain things um, by hand, and I'll publish a slide later when I when I fix them. So I apologize again for this. Um, there's a fact: if these points P and Q are both on the curve, and there is actually, and that's has some math there. There is a large number d, so that p is equals d times q. Okay, cool, fine that you can prove that there is such a number, but we, we also know from the discrete logarithm problem you can't calculate the number. But imagine someone knows um, someone knows this number d. Some, someone has this number d, I don't know, may, maybe you're, uh, you're paragnostic and you, you see what number d is. Okay, now is this someone first uh, and again, I apologize for the, the mess. First, they're able to calculate the whole output, not just R1, but the missing bit, the missing two bytes. It, it needs to check 65,000 points on uh, whether one of them is a curve, and that's only one, and that's easy. That's, the computers can do it trivially. So we can assume the computer knows the whole output, not just 30 bytes, but the whole 32 bytes. And um, then they know R1. Sorry, they know, uh, yeah, they know R1, and they also know D. So they can take d times this number, um, which is uh, okay. No, no, sorry, I, I should say one more thing. Uh, so they do. They know r1. So they know n1 times q uh, as a number. But actually, finding the corresponding point is, is also trivial. So okay, they know the point n1 times q. Still, doesn't give you uh, give you n1, but they can multiply it with d, which they paragnostically know. So okay, d times n1 times q. Um, which is the same as n1 times d times q. And n1 times d times q is n1 times p. So if you know this number d, you can go from r1 to the next internal state, to uh, n2, n2, n3, etc. So if you know d, then you've cracked this algorithm. So that's, that's a $10 million question. And this would be nice if this appeared gradually. Uh, does anyone know D? And, and, and thankfully, this is like all these algorithms, they're, they're public, you can look them up. Uh, it's a NIST algorithm. And, and NIST helpfully acknowledges um, Mike Boyle and Mary Bass from the National Security Agency for assistance I in developing by the recommendation. Um, I think that's a subtle way of saying they came up with this points P and Q, and they chose the P and Q in a way they, they knew D. So um, they basically uh, they choose a random point Q on the, on the curve, a random number D, and another number P. And this, this is in the algorithm. Uh, and this is the, the, the famous dually C DRBG um, backdoor to random number generator. Uh, dual refers to the two points, EC, obviously the curves, and, and DRBG is another way of saying pseudo random number generator. It's the deterministic random bit generator. Um, it, it's good to, uh, there's a few things to say about this. Uh, firstly, it ha this has been used, and there's a subtle reference here, RSA, the, the, the maker of various crypto uh, uh, libraries, uh, they use it as a default random number generator, allegedly after they got paid $10 million by the NSA, which is probably a bad deal. Um, secondly, um, if you're not worried about the NSA, and, and you, know, you may be worried about the NSA, but in many cases, in individual cases, you're not. And if you're using online banking, you know, if the NSA wanted to, they could just go to the bank and say, what are you spending? What is this person spending your money on? So there's a lot of cases where we're not worried about the NSA. And in these cases, this is a fine algorithm. It's completely secure, uh, because uh, assuming NSA doesn't share this D with criminals. But OK, it's fine. But it's actually, uh, for many other reasons, it's a, it's a rubbish algorithm. It, it is slow. It's, uh, yeah, it's unnecessarily slow, basically. There was no good reason to accept this. But NSA, using some, some money and some, uh, some of its powers, they did that. So, there are two consequences of the OEC DRBG, which, which happened a few years ago. Uh, it, I think it became public in 2013 after, after Snowden leaks. Uh, people distrust any algorithm provided by the NSA, and I think that's that's wrong. Uh, not because I'm, I'm such a big fan of the NSA, but I think algorithms should be fine 
even if they're written by your arch enemy. Um, you should just make sure that the algorithm doesn't have backdoors. Um, it's a bit like open source code, you know. If you're a supporter of open source software, then you kind of expect, um, you kind of, you should be able to, to verify the software, you should trust the software regardless of who wrote it. I know it's a bit more complicated in practice, but I, yeah, I think that just throwing away algorithms because the NSA designed them is, is not helpful. Uh, maybe makes people trust other parties more than they should. Uh, and NSA has some really good cryptographers. Uh, but what is, is a better trend is uh, nothing up my sleep number. So numbers in um, uh, numbers in elliptic curve cryptography and in standards uh, are often uh, coming out of nowhere. So I, I printed a curve here, x y squared equals x cubed plus minus 3x plus 41058 and then another 40 odd numbers. Um, this is this curve P256 that we use, that I use to connect to an NSEC uh, .io. There's absolutely no reason to assume this is backdoored. In, in fact, we can be fair, everyone, maybe except for extremely paranoid, but people like Bruce Schneier, they all agree that this is not backdoored. But it's still bad practice. So people are moving now towards something called curve 25519. And this, this, this number refers to the prime number, actually. Um, but this number, this curve has parameters that, 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 that you can explain. Like, why did I choose these parameters? I was looking for a number with these five properties, and this is the smallest one that satisfies it. That's, OK, that can't be backdoored. If, if everyone agrees that these properties need to be satisfied, then saying the smallest number, that's not a backdoor. If you're saying, well, we look for these five properties, and, and here's a, a very large number, and, and trust this, it, okay, look, you can check, then you should be wary. Okay. Um, almost done. I, uh, do we have enough time still? Okay. Okay. Um, there's a few attacks on elliptic curve cryptography. This is one of the better known attacks on, on poor implementations. So ignore the, the blue and the red bit for a bit. This is again elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. So uh, it's a public known curve, E and a point P on the curve, and, and Alice and Bob choose random numbers A and B, and they send A times B and B, B times B. Uh, but now we're in a situation where Bob is not using the ephemeral version. They're actually use, he's actually using uh, a static B for all uh, connections, which some algorithms, some implementations still do. And there, there are, I think, the disadvantages outweigh the advantages, but in general, I think this is, um, uh, there are sometimes good reasons to do this. So, Bob is a web server, talks to anyone, uh, and he's not suddenly not talking to some kind of Alice, but he's talking to Mallory. And Mallory doesn't choose a random number A. Mallory chooses a point P of, sorry, a point Q of small order, say order five, which means that you go one times Q, two times Q, three times Q, four times Q, five times Q, and then six times Q is Q again. So there's only you keep going in circles. So there are only five possibilities for multiples of, two, of Q. Uh, and he uses that. And that's what she sends to Bob. Bob thinks this is, this is some kind of A times B for some A. So Bob thinks, OK, B times A times B. Actually, he's calculating B times Q. And uh, that's his, um, that he thinks that's the shared key. Now, there's two things to say about this. The first is, um, this point is not even on the curve. There are. In, sometimes Bob, so poor implementations that is, don't check if a point sent to you by, by Alice or Mallory is on the curve. And uh, there are curves related to, to a fixed curve um, that don't give any problems. Like if you do calculations, you won't notice it. If you never check if a point is on the curve, it, calculations work. You're just calculating it on a different curve without realizing. Um, so uh, the second thing to notice is that uh, there are only few possibilities, only five in, in my example of um, of B times Q, which Bob is using as a, as a private key. So Bob is encrypting some data with uh, with Mallory, and uh, Mallory can just check the five possibilities because she knows Q, She's, she sent Q to Bob, and, and one of these five is correct. That doesn't give her B, but it gives her B mod five. She can find out whether B ends on a, on a one over four, or a, sorry, one, one over six, or on a two over seven, or a three over an eight. So she reduces the number of possibilities for B by a factor of five. Uh, she can continue this, and, and no B is static. She can choose another curve with another Q of order three, and then seven, and then 11. And she knows B mod a lot of prime numbers, and there's something in math called the Chinese remainder theorem, which helps her find the original B. So if Bob doesn't check, um, 
doesn't check if points are in, on, on the curve, you can uh, attack it this way. And this is actually used in practice. Uh, there's Java, I think Oracle library somewhere. There's, there's quite a few libraries that don't check this. Okay, last thing. Um, this is, so you know, Diffie-Hellman, for uh, the curve Diffie-Hellman depends on the discrete logarithm problem. One way to see it, you know, this is all over the placeness. It, computers can't see structure when it's all over the placeness. But there is actually some structure. It's basically just a circle. It's just that it doesn't look like a circle because you go all the way over the, over the curve and a trillion times a trillion times. Um, but there is some structure. And quantum computers, which are these new magical things that maybe we get at some point, are able to see the structure. That's one way of viewing it. And they can crack this algorithm relatively easily. So we need to find um, uh, new algorithms if we're worried about uh, quantum computers. And people are already worried about this because sometimes government data is stored for a long time. You know, um, if you store data for for uh, for 30 years, you want to store it for 30 years, then you need to protect against computers that we have in 30 years. So people are already playing it. I don't know where they will get quantum computers, where they will get good ones ever, and people are still not sure about that. But okay, we may. And there is a Diffie-Hellman variant that uses um, elliptic curve uh, cryptography in, in, in a different way. So this is the general Diffie-Hellman. And there's, there's a, a standard version of Diffie-Hellman, which is maybe one of the, the oldest public key algorithm. Uh, so 40 years old. Um, it's elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, that's we just thought. But in general, there's a structure, like an elliptic curve, with integer multiplication, in the way I defined it, and a base element P, a point, and then Okay, this is A and B chosen randomly, and A times B, B times B, etc. So th there's a more general algorithm. There is um, a ver an elliptic curve variant that works post quantum computers. The structure here is is the class of elliptic curves, of, or a class of particular elliptic curve. Um, in fact, it, it, for some irony, it's a class of elliptic curves that are very unsuitable for normal elliptic curve cryptography. But for some reason, this, this class is very suitable for post-contact cryptography. Integer multiplication is, or multiplication is more than one curve into another curve. And you, you can, if you morph one curve into another curve and then follow the same morphing and follow the same morphing, you know, if you do it five times, you, you, you multiply it by five. I know I'm not explaining this very well. Um, I'd almost say, I mean, yeah, no, I, I have to admit, I, I do find this also confusing. I, I, I can follow the, the steps, the algorithm, which is again is on Wikipedia, but that's that's about it. Um, but still, th this this morphing of curves into each other, that's what you use. And the base element is a fixed curve E. So what what what, what Alice and Bob do in this case is uh, they morph E into two different curves, which they, they kind of exchange, and together they then combine this to get a new key, which is their shared key. Curve is turned to a number in some magical way, and this this main number is shared uh, the shared key. Okay, that's almost done. Conclusion, um, elliptic cryptography is hard, and, and, and hard in, in uh, inverted commas. Uh, Chinese is hard if you don't if, if you never study Chinese. Um, English is hard if, if you live in China and never study English. Uh, but elliptic curve cryptography, like, like a language, requires years of studying, and um, years of studying mathematics, and it's easy to make mistakes. Um, and that's a weakness. I think elliptic curve cryptography, um, compared to, say, RSA algorithm, it's just easier to make mistakes. The people implementing algorithms understand them less well. Uh, I understand them less well. I find RSA easier, less fun, but it's easier. We, we know how it's attacked. Uh, I don't think um, the dual EC backdoor could have worked in some RSA-like algorithm because it's too easy to spot. Um, the reason why people still use elliptic curve cryptography, um, despite this weakness, and, and, and I can't emphasize enough, this is a weakness. This is not a strength. You want your algorithms to be as, as, as well understood as possible. You want, you don't want an algorithm where three people in this room kind of understand what's going on. You want one where everyone can just read it and follow it and check mistakes. But okay, yeah, sometimes you need to compromise a bit. Elliptic curves, there are enough people that understand it. The keys you can use are a lot shorter. Algorithms are faster. That's, that's just about worth it. But don't go further than that. And, and actually, people are looking at ways to do um, 
post quantum elliptic curve, elliptic cryptography in a way that I just explained, uh, super singular isogenies, uh, as they're called. And and there was recently a paper by Adam Langley, which is a cryptographer from Google, and, and he actually pointed out that this very point, that this is a weakness, that the fact that that, that this is a very hard algorithm, it's it's a weakness. It, it may have advantages, but actually maybe we can find an easier algorithm. You slightly longer keys, but maybe that's that's better. Um, that's it. I, I, I hope it's somewhat understandable. Um, that's my email address, that's my, my Twitter handle. Um, if, yeah, uh, there's probably some time for questions or, or comments or anything. I'm, I'm fine either way. So.